May peace and God's mercy and blessings be upon you. I would like to welcome all of our viewers, so welcome to a new episode of our program celebrating the best women on earth. Today's episode, God willing, is about the second wife who was patient and enduring, whose only concern was her husband, home, and only son. God willed that her sa'i, or walk, be immortalized as one of the rites of Hajj and Umrah. We shall never forget her famous words when she asked the blessed Abraham, Is this God's will? And he answered, Yes. And she replied, then we shall never be lost. The epitome of obedience, surrender, and reliance on God Almighty, and a great example to be followed. I am sure that by now you have guessed today's episode is about whom. But first of all, let me please welcome my dear friend and teacher, Dr. Abla Al-Kahlawi. Oh, many thanks, my darling. May God fill your heart with gladness. Today's episode is about the Blessed Hajar. Yes, God willing. In the name of God, the Beneficent, the Merciful. The truth is, Hajar is an image or a character that is very important in our lives. A woman troubled, yet she is enduring. She endures being the second wife when she was a princess. Not a slave? I can't say she was a princess and not a slave. She believes and grows attached to this faith. It makes her feel as if she is constantly surrounded by a divine presence and that everything in the world is insignificant so long as she is surrounded by this presence. She is patient about being away from her husband at a time when the husband is needed the most. For when a woman is pregnant, she overflows with tenderness. And I say this to every husband, you should be extra sensitive and attentive when your wife is pregnant. And after she gives birth, she could have postpartum depression. Yes, but while pregnant, she will be in great need because these are rushes of great tenderness that engulf the fetus. Oh God. That's why she sees him with her heart before she sees him with her eyes. But at the same time, it was faith that allowed Hajar to be patient. And it was faith that allowed Abraham, peace be upon him, to take this particular stance in his complete obedience to God Almighty. Anyway, he takes his wife to this place. But before I describe the life she lived in this place, I want to comment on something. Hajar was said was a princess, like I said, and it was also said that she was a Nubian and that she was from Port Said. And there is evidence to all three claims, but it is most likely that she was Nubian because of the native costume, or Girgar, which she used to insist on wearing. It is the traditional dress of a Nubian woman. Secondly, the word Zim Zim, which she said, the spring of Zamzam. Exactly. It is the root of a Nubian word, which is now said, Sam Sam. It is the exact same word. What actually happened to her to end up a slave then? The circumstances at the time of the pharaohs, well, we all know how they were like. And as it is said in the Quran, she said, Lo, kings, when they enter a township, ruin it and make the honor of its people shame. Thus will they do. Anyway, she was a slave girl until what happened happened. And we already know the history of the story. Either way, Abraham brought her to the valley of Faran, near the mountains of Mecca. And he left her there near a white hill. But because of her faith, every time she looked at it, she felt reassured. And every time her husband would place the food and water on the ground and prepare to go, she would latch onto him for the fear of him going away. And at one point she looked at him and saw that something was troubling him deeply. And he looked up to heaven and said, Our Lord, lo, I have settled some of my posterity in an uncultivable valley near unto thy holy house, our Lord, that they may establish proper worship, so incline some hearts of men, that they may yearn towards them, and provide thou them with fruits, in order that they may be thankful. Meaning, he understood where it was he was leaving them. Does that not make God's will, a divine will that Hajar is left in this specific place? But Hajar was a strong and tough lady, she was patient and a believer. 
so that when she looked at him, beseeching God with those words, she understood that this was something out of his hands. And in his eyes, she saw all that he could not tell her, and she felt sorry for him. And that is when she said, so long as this is God's will, we will never be lost, meaning she understood it was divine will. Yes. He fought back tears, kissed his infant, and comforted her. And he remained that way back and forth and back and forth for a while until she said those famous words, we will never be lost. A brave woman to accept traveling this way and to remain in a desert with no food source or water compared to these days when women will not only refuse to travel on their own but also with their husbands and ask him to go abroad on his own because she cannot leave her family and friends. They are spoiled, my dear. I mean, she was in a place that is described, you could hear the groaning of the earth. No souls are born in it, and the fragrance of those buried in the earth is non-existent. There are no angels on that area. No souls being born and no souls die there. It is completely desolate and abandoned. But she sat and waited patiently until her water and food began to run out, and her infant began to be restless and started crying. And so she ran and climbed the nearby hill where the Safa is and searched but found no one. She would walk at first. Then she would hear her child cry and would start running back to the Marwa. Seven times she ran back and forth but not a soul was to be found. She looked for water, for anyone to see, any help. She found nothing. At this point, she gave up and said to herself, If it's destined for me to die here, oh I will hold my son, and we will meet our maker together. And so she held the little infant and sat on the ground. Oh, poor Hajar, she did everything she could to no avail. She looked for water and climbed the Safa and the Merwa and looked all around but found nothing. When we run out of options, that is when we resolve to our fates. And with the grace of God, the little infant kicked the ground with his heels. And where he had struck, the blessed spring began to flow. And that is where the water of Zamzam came out of the earth. How lovely. It came out with such force. She kept saying, Zimmi, Zimmi, meaning control your flow or they would have drowned at it force. <laughs> yes. And that is why this water was extraordinary. It is known by many names. Healer, sufficient the healthy, wellness, freshness, satiety for hunger, and cure for disease, the victory of Gabriel, and the fountain of Ismail. And that is why Al-Habib, peace be upon him, used to say, the water of Zamzam will fulfill whatever purpose for which it is drunk. If drunk for healing, God will heal you. If drunk for aid, God will aid you. Peace be upon him. A short break, my dears, and we will return with our episode. And here we are, still looking at the biography of the Blessed Hajar, the wife of the Prophet Abraham, peace be upon him. And as we said, putting all faith in God and having a certainty that God will answer our prayers and for us to do what we can, leaving the rest in the hands of the Almighty, is how the Blessed Hajar found the water of Zamzam as was God's will. Yes, as I told you, the water provided nutrition, medicine and wellness. It really was and is everything. And so all her needs were satisfied by it. There was no other source of food. There was just the water. And the boy, through God's will, was able to grow. From the bountiful, nutritious milk she was able to give him. Because of the water, many birds flew around them. And those birds increased in number. And at the sight of the birds, a passing caravan 
realized there would be water. And so they came her way and sought her permission to reside in the area. And so she gave them her terms. First of all, Zamzam belongs to no one. And they agreed. So she continued with her terms, that she would continue to live there, and they agreed. And so on. And so she lived among them, and along with her, they took care of Ismail, peace be upon him. They provided her with food and shelter so she could dedicate her time to the care of the child. And so this makes her the first woman to make this sort of a pledge of a contract. And where was Abraham in all of this? After he left her at first, he returned to his home, but came to visit them. And he found that the infant had grown into a healthy young boy, and he found the place he left her in had prospered, and they began cultivating the land. He saw the people and the water, and God had answered his prayer. And so he came to complete the second half of the Qur'anic verse, that they may establish proper worship. And so the word of God came that he build the holy house. And when Abraham and Ishmael were raising the foundations of the house, Abraham prayed, Our Lord, accept from us this duty. Lo, thou, only thou art the hearer, the knower. And so together with his son, they began building a place of worship. The building rose and grew at the hand of the young man and at the hand of the old man. A symbolic image for life, for life cannot simply be full of youth, because with the youth there will always be haste, and as you can see these days, and so it is necessary to have the wisdom that comes with old age, and the wisdom of a community's elderly. And he went over and beyond what he had to do, and that is why we go over and beyond. And with that I say we only are supposed to go to Hajj once, but after we do, we find that we are longing for it and we do again and we miss it again, so we go a third time. I hope God wills it for everyone. Don't tell me our time is up. No, not at all. Okay, great. So Hajar began to feel safe and secure at his presence and her family became complete. And that is when he saw a dream, a message from God telling him he must sacrifice Ismail. And on the day, the boy went out with his father thinking that it was just another day of work and that they would be out building something or another. But he said to him, Oh, my dear son, I have seen in a dream that I must sacrifice thee. It was a vision. And the boy said to him, He said, Oh, my father, do that which thou art commanded. That is how Blessed Hajar raised him. Allah willing, thou shalt find me of the steadfast. You see, he was enduring just as his mother was a believer, the son of a believer. And so he took her son from her, but she neither cried nor resisted, although it's her only child. Yet another big test of her faith. Just like the first test, but much harder. Of course. But she had forsaken the world for God Almighty and her son, and it was through him that she felt she had a purpose in this life, to bring him up and to teach him. And she was a good mother. Bringing him up, so that he behaved like a mature young man, even as a young boy. Yes, what God may will. I want to emphasize how much greater in magnitude the second test was more than the first one, because he grew up and he brought so much joy into her life, and she was greatly attached to him. She felt that God had blessed her with him for all of her patience, and yet when he took him into the desert... Yes. She did not scream or yell or ask for help. She did nothing but hand over the trust and turn to God because she was certain that God's love is more important. And this reminds us of the Prophet's words, peace be upon him, when he said, love one another sparingly, meaning that even when we love our children, the ones we love the most, it can surpass our love for God because hardship is unbearable when a mother is so attached to her child that it ails her. For he was the blessing and the sign that all would be well. That is why they say you do not know what you have until you lose it. When you live without a blessing and then you receive it, it changes your life. For sure. That is why if you want to see the true meaning of a blessing, Look into the eyes of a sick person who has been cured by God. 
for only he can feel the true depth of having his full health restored. A true blessing can be seen in the person who was troubled and God lifted the weight off his shoulder, or he who was imprisoned and God freed him. There are people who live such blessed life and they take them for granted. And when they lose those blessings to have a small part restored, we'll have them saying thanks be to God for our blessings. And that is why she is an example of one who understood God's words. Do men imagine that they will be left at ease because they say we believe and will not be tested with affliction? And so she was a believer, one who was content with God's will. But Ismail was returned to her and her journey was completed. And the story of the blessed Hajar between as safa and Marwa is one of the rites of Hajj or pilgrimage, in addition to the stoning of Satan is performed during Hajj. Why do you think? What I want to say is the pilgrimage has its symbolic reflections of human life. At that time, did Hajar herself actually stone Iblis? Yes, of course. What happened is that Iblis came to her and wanted her to question Abraham as to know why or how Stirring dare he trouble. take away her son. Trying to steer trouble, exactly. And that is why she stoned him. And when she did, he went to Abraham, who was also stoning him. And that is when he turned to the child, provoking him not to listen to his father. And he too stoned him. So that stoning is symbolic of stoning the devil within you, stoning all of your bad deeds, so that you can return to your original state just as you were the day you were born. And for us to be able to return our souls to the pure state, we must kill our bad selves. And that is symbolized by the sacrifice. And the same is true of the shaved heads, so that we symbolically leave this world and have a fresh start. And that is why the pilgrimage is a voyage of life and a voyage of death. Look at how you begin it, just as a person is, at the end of their life, dressed in a shroud. The clothes of Hajj are a shroud. And so we begin our Hajj just as we are when we end our life. After returning, we are reborn. And then you have the Safa and the Marwa. That is symbolic of our passing through life so quickly. And yet, what do we take with us? And what have we done with our lives? Were our deeds good or bad? Did we follow God's words when He said, But seek the abode of the hereafter in that which Allah hath given thee, and neglect not thy portion of the world. Were you truly following the word of God or not? Many interconnected things, and that is why we learn so much from the blessed Hajar. It is enough that she is a monument standing tall historically and religiously. She is an example of the enduring woman, accepting and content in God's will. A content woman. Dutiful to her husband. Dutiful to her husband and content with very little. And this teaches us that to this world and its possessions, very little matters. And so we must be content and to say the words that Yahya ibn Mu'adh used to always say, may God be pleased with him. If thee gives me, I accepted. And if thee withheld, I was content. And if thee left me, I worshipped. And if thee called, I answered. And with those beautiful words, I thank you, my dear. And at the end of another episode celebrating the best women on earth, we have learned so much from the blessed Hajar. May God be pleased with her. She was a true mother, was content, and had all of her faith put into God and his will. A dutiful wife who brought her son up to be a pious and faithful man. This is the blessed Hajar. May God be pleased with her. And with that, I leave you hoping you will be well. Godspeed. May peace and God's blessings and mercy be upon you. <laughs>